Mayor John Cooper, followed by Dr. Alex Jahungir, Chair of the Metro Board of Health and the Metro Coronavirus Task Force. This morning, we are also joined by Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College, Jim Brown, Tennessee State Director of the National Federation of Independent Business, and Lisa Quigley, Chief of Staff, Chief of Staff for U.S. Representative Jim Cooper. Director Chief William Swan of the Office of Emergency Management at Nashville Fire Department and Dr. Michael Caldwell, Director of the Metro Public Health Department, are with us to help answer your questions. We will now begin with Mayor John Cooper. Good morning, Nashville. Yesterday, our partners at Vanderbilt reported that our efforts to flatten the curve of COVID-19 in Nashville are working. Their model shows that the virus transmission rate in Davidson County and our surrounding counties, which measures how many people get the coronavirus from each infected person, has fallen below a rate of one to the point of shrinking the outbreak. Now, if the transmission rate is reduced below one for a significant amount of time, then the virus will recede. Researchers at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine have also reported that many infected people in Nashville may no longer be passing coronavirus to anyone else because of the safer at home order and aggressive social distancing measures. And the overall number of people who are carrying the virus has begun to shrink. Now this report is the best evidence yet that social distancing is working and we are on the right path here in Davidson County to both suppress and eradicate the virus. And I'm incredibly grateful to everyone's hard work in following the safer at home order. Now yesterday, my office announced the formation of the Tennessee Major Metro's Economic Restart Task Force, along with Memphis Mayor Jim Strickland, Knoxville Mayor India Kincannon, and, Nash and Chattanooga Mayor Andy Burke. This group of mayors has been in regular contact with both Governor Bill Lee and the state's COVID-19 Unified Command, and we want to thank them. This task force is working alongside the state and is composed of both business leaders and healthcare professionals. It will make sure we do not lose the hard-earned progress we've achieved here in Nashville over the past few weeks as we look forward to reopening. The task force is organized to help us transition into the next phases safely and help us restart local economies statewide in an effective and co co coordinated manner. Now, members of the task force will evaluate proposed protocols, best practices, and public health standards based on the advice of medical experts. The task force will examine carefully when businesses are safe to reopen, how businesses can be smoothly phased into a responsible reopening strategy, and best practices for businesses to safely serve their customers while protecting their staff in the COVID-19 era. Now, this includes goals for testing, equipment, healthcare capacity for each phase of our economic restart plan. Now, I'm grateful to Nashville's four representatives to the Tennessee Major Metro's Economic Restart Task Force members, and that is Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College, Laura Hollingsworth, Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Opry Entertainment Group, Ryman Hospitality Properties. Dr. Alex Jahanger, Chair of the Metro Board of Health and the Metro Coronavirus Task Force. And Rob McCabe, Chairman of Pinnacle Financial Partners and the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. Now I look forward to sharing details of our economic restart plan as they develop in the days and the weeks to come. But in the meantime, we must stay the course to protect public health and continue saving lives. Our thoughts are with those who are fighting the coronavirus disease throughout Davidson County. And we send our condolences to the loved ones of those who have died. Now I urge everyone to continue following the safer at home order. Please remain at home whenever possible. Only leave your homes to run essential errands and do wear face coverings when social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. Now, as a reminder, Metro's community assessment centers are open today and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. 
If you believe you have symptoms of COVID-19, please call the COVID-19 hotline at 615-862-7777, which is a free service and open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If additional assessment is necessary, you may be directed to a community assessment center to be screened and tested for COVID-19. All services at Metro's community assessment centers, including COVID-19 tests, are also free, free to Nashville residents. Community assessment centers are open at Nissan Stadium, Lot N, Meharry Medical College at 918 21st Avenue North, and 2491 Murfreesboro Pike at a former Kmart site in Antioch. Again, if you suspect that you may have symptoms of COVID-19, do not hesitate to call the COVID-19 hotline at 615-862-7777. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, also known as the CARES Act, was passed on March 27th to provide economic relief for American workers and small business owners affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. In addition to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the CARES Act provides valuable resources for Nashvillians who are facing hardships during this time, including the Pay Paycheck Pro Protection Program, PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, for employers and their employees, and expanded eligibility for unemployment insurance, and an, an additional $600 per week in unemployment benefits. Gig workers and freelancers who are critical to Nashville's economy are also covered by unemployment insurance for the first time. Now I want to welcome Jim Brown, Tennessee State Director of the National Feder Federation of Independent Businesses, and Lisa Quigley, Chief of Staff for Congressman Jim Cooper, for joining us by video conference this morning to explain these various programs and how Nashvillians who qualify can obtain and benefit from them. And as always, I'm grateful to Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College, for being here to provide his thoughtful insights into the COVID-19 outbreak and our community's efforts in eradicating the disease. Now, our thoughts do remain with our friends in Chattanooga who are recovering from the deadly storms over the Easter weekend. Anyone able to contribute should visit the Community Resource Center's website at crcnashville.org to find a list of items that will help our friends in Hamilton County in the cleanup and recovery process. I also urge everyone to visit covid19.nashville.gov to donate as you are able to the COVID-19 Response Fund, which has been created to help Nashvillians facing hardships during this time. You can also visit the website to learn how to obtain direct financial food, mental health, and social service assistance. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Alex Shahanger, Chair of the Metro Coronavirus Task Force. Thank you, Mayor Cooper, and good morning, Nashville. Here's the latest information on the COVID-19 virus in our city. We now have 1,597 confirmed cases in National and Davidson County, an increase of 37 in the past 24 hours. There are an additional 1,574 in our surrounding counties, bringing our total in our region to nearly 3,200. Of the Davidson County cases, 752 cases are currently active, meaning that 825 residents have fully recovered and are now cleared. We did have two additional deaths last night, a 71-year-old woman and a 66-year-old man. Both had underlying medical conditions. My thoughts are with their families and friends. That also makes it a total of 20 people in Nashville that have died because of the COVID-19 virus. As Mayor Cooper said, he and the major mayors of the three other cities have formed the Tennessee Major Metro's Economics Restart Task Force. Business leaders and healthcare professionals from four cities will join the city and county mayors to begin planning the reopening of our communities. The mayor appointed Dr. Hilder and me to join the task force along with other leaders he mentioned. I appreciate the opportunity to serve and look forward to working with the other task force members, the mayors, and working with the state as we begin to map out how we will begin to emerge from the impact of COVID-19. We will use the best science and common sense to develop a plan to open up our cities. I suspect we will be, this will be in multiple stages and we will take steps to open and make sure the virus remains in check before moving on to the next step. 
We'll try to avoid the experiences that others have experienced from around the world, and we don't want to open up too quickly and have the virus peak a second time. And if the virus starts to spread, we will move to quickly contain it. When the plan is finalized by this group and the mayors, and we, we will begin sharing with you the timing and how you will, we will get back to our new normal. Also, as the mayor mentioned, this morning our community assessment centers will be opened at 9 a.m. and stay open until 3 p.m. The three locations are at Nissan Stadium, at Meharry Medical College, and at the Kmart in Antioch. These centers are for all national residents and available to, at no cost. Residents can drive up or walk up if you prefer, and you will be screened and if necessary receive the test for the COVID-19 virus. We've been fortunate that our wait, lines have, wait times have been very low, and the process takes about five or 10 minutes to complete. Since opening on March 31st, 2,446 residents have been assessed and 1,712 have been tested. If you think you're not feeling well or you think you have the virus, please seek medical attention. As a reminder, the symptoms of the virus include fever, chill, shortness of breath, new onset loss of smell, or new onset unexplained diarrhea. If you have any questions or concerns, please call our community assessment hotline at 615-862-7777. This hotline is open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Now, finally, you may have read the headline today that said Nashville is starving the coronavirus. Now, this is true, and I am grateful to all of you for your efforts, but this is not the time to let up. You know, I'm fortunate to coach my nine-year-old daughter's basketball team, and what I tell them and what I've been told when I was in sports by coaches is to enjoy the success, but stay focused on the game and the game plan. We're not at the end of the fourth quarter by any means. You can best fight this virus by staying at home. Only go out if it's absolutely necessary. If you do have to go out, please stay six feet from others and wear a face covering. We are, we are Nashville and we truly are in this all together. I now would like to introduce Dr. James Childers of Meharry Medical College. Thank you. Good morning, Nashville. As we began to make plans to reopen businesses and other public facilities, there's a concept I'd like us to understand, to understand why this cannot be as simple as turning on a switch. I've mentioned this concept before, but it bears repeating as we seriously contemplate relaxing those things that have kept us safe thus far. The concept is called herd immunity. And I'd like to use measles as an example to illustrate this concept. Measles, like SARS virus, the one that causes COVID-19, is highly contagious, and measles can remain in the air for several hours. Prior to 1963, there were global outbreaks of measles that resulted in the deaths of two million or more people every year. This all changed in 1963 when a vaccine was introduced and administered to people all over the world. The vaccination program was so successful here in the United States that in 2000, the year 2000, after a full year without any reported transmissions, the CDC declared that the virus had been eliminated from our country. The resulting vaccination program meant that large numbers of people were immune to measles virus. As a matter of fact, the level of immunity approached 90% or more. What that means is that if a person who's infected came into contact with other people, there was a very, very low risk that the virus would jump from the infected person to the uninfected person. That's what herd, herd immunity means. It means that there are so many resistant individuals to the virus that it cannot jump from an infected person to another person. And that is the concept of herd immunity. So vaccination is one way to achieve this, but there's another way that's much less desirable. And that is to do nothing, to let the virus sweep through the population those that survive would survive with immunity. And now when that virus appears again, it would not spread through the population because there are so many people immune to it. Now clearly we do not want to take that approach to COVID-19 because it would mean that as many as 100 million people could be infected and millions of people could die. And clearly that is not something we want to see here in this country. And 
Because the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 was only seen first in December of 2019, none of us had any existing immunity to it, and that is why it's racing through the global population the way that it is. According to Johns Hopkins University COVID-19 trapping mapping system, there have been 2.1 million diagnosed cases around the globe. And if you consider there are 7.8 billion of us, that represents only three tenths that three people out of every 10,000 that have become infected, a very, very low percentage of the global population. Here in the United States, according to that same tracking system, there have been 667,000 cases, diagnosed cases. One thing to point out is that even though the United States only represents 4% of the population, that's actually 31% of all the cases that have been diagnosed. And that is not a good statement on how well we're doing against this virus. So if everyone in the United States who got COVID-19 survived it and had immunity, that would only be two-tenths of one-tenth of a percent of people resistant, not even remotely close to what we need to achieve herd immunity. What that all means is that if we open the pipes or the economy too quickly, we'll find ourselves right back where we started from. The contagiousness of viruses is measured by something called the basic reproduction, reproductive rate. And for example, for measles, it can be as high as 18. And what it tells us is how many people on average get the virus from someone who's infected. So imagine how contagious a virus is if 18 people can get it from one person. Thankfully for the COVID-19 virus, it's much less than that, but it's still significant, somewhere between two and five globally. So as the mayor pointed out, it appears that we have reduced the basic reproductive rate in Nashville to one. What that means is that on average, one person gives the virus to one other person. But please think about this. Given an average doubling time of transmission of three days, that means there can be 20 transmission cycles in two months. And if you do the basic math, that means that one person could be responsible for one million infections on their own. Yes, you heard me correctly. One person who can only transmit it to another person, if it doubles every three days, the transmissions, that means a million infections could come from one person. So by all means, we cannot let down our guard. Our goal is to get that basic reproductive number to as close to zero as possible. And when it drops below one, that means the virus is disappearing from our population. So if we are gone to reopen the economy, my suggestion is that each one of us take the responsibility to keep ourselves protected, and by doing so, we protect those around us. And as Dr. Jahangir said, we still have work to do. We can be glad about the work that's been done because we have done some serious work to reduce the virus transmission, but there's still work to do, and we need to do that. So please stay at home, wash your hands frequently, Wear a face covering when you're out and about. Make sure you sanitize, frequently touch surfaces, and we'll get through this. And if we do this, we can get back to a new normal sooner than would otherwise be the case. And now in Nashville, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Jim Brown. Thank you. And thank you, Mayor Cooper. I really appreciate you asking for the small business perspective and maybe a few ways we can help our entrepreneurs. Um, NFIB has 6,000 small business owners in Tennessee who are members, many of them here in Nashville. We've been surveying our members weekly, and here's what we know. About half of small employers say they can survive for no more than two months under the current conditions, and about one-third believe they can remain operational for three to six months. And before COVID, um, even before um, the virus, one in five small business owners, they already had cash flow challenges. So these SBA loans that you've asked me to talk about are very, very critical. And we're hearing what you're hearing, lots of questions about um, these SBA loans, the PPPLs, the EIDLs, the Payment Protection Program loans, the Economic Injury Disaster loans. Both apply if you have 500 employees or fewer, and both apply if you're a sole proprietor, independent contractor, or a self-employed individual. And I'll talk about each loan program separately, just do the basics and give some links to help some folks as well as share my email at the end of the presentation here. All right, PPPLs, these are the loans that are forgivable after eight weeks 
if you keep your employees on payroll. They really kind of act like a grant on the front end. You have to go through an approved SBA lender to apply. And in addition to using the monies for payroll, you can also use them for rent, utilities, and mortgage interest. And NFIB fought very hard for that and the CARES Act to get that in there. You, you do need to check on the stipulations of percentages, but uh, it is available to you there. The PP program is open through June 30, 2020. You can still apply, of course. The maximum loan size is 10 million. The interest rate is 1%, which is terrific. And you have um, up to two years to, to pay off the loan. There is really, really good information. Christina Simpson and her group um, with the Nashville Small Business Task Force, put it, it's got a great website. Mayor, you should be proud. And, and I'm going to read it a few times here, but it's sbtfnashville.com. sbtfnashville.com. There's a lot of good information on the loans. Um, both the, the IDLs and the PPBLs, and there's also good information connecting you to a lot of groups like NFIB, a lot of chambers, um, Tennessee bankers, and other others that you uh, can access. I would also encourage small business owners to visit our dedicated COVID website, which is nfib.com backslash coronavirus. We've already posted five very informative webinars on, on these SBA loans and some other things like the the paid leave requirements and the family's first law uh, that passed before the CARES Act. As of yesterday morning, all of the $350 billion in the PPP funds authorized by the CARES Act, it's either been paid or it's in the approval process. And yes, the money um, has been slow to hit bank accounts of quite a few small business owners, but the good news is that we're, we're hearing it's starting to flow now and um, you know, hopefully a lot of these small business owners will see this in the next week or so. Um, this is very important. The money, more money is needed from Congress. We, quite simply, Congress needs to act now to authorize uh, more monies and so that new applicants, up until that June 30 date, applicants who are waiting in line, waiting for approvals. There are tens of thousands of small business owners in Tennessee that are still in line that they can get the relief that they need. I'll end on the PPPLs by saying that our banks in Tennessee have been doing tremendous work and a really big tip of the hat to Colin Barrett and his team at the Tennessee Bankers Association and also um, Commissioner Greg Gonzalez with uh, financial institutions at the state. Uh, they've been really helping a lot of our members and a lot of other folks. All right, the EIDLs, the EIDLs, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, they were the first before the PPPLs. Um, the, you, do, you apply directly through the SBA for these loans. You do not go through your bank. The loans are collateralized. They're not forgivable like that. the PPPLs. The maximum loan size is $2 million, and they're due in 30 years. Interest rates are also very good, 3.75% uh, for businesses, and for nonprofits, it's 2.75%. Applicants who apply for this loan may request an advanced emergency idle grant of up to 10,000 from the SBA, but there's some things you should be aware of. First, the promise was that you would get that 10,000 up front within three days, and that didn't happen. Um, some money is starting to hit, but most who applied are still waiting some three, three and a half weeks now. The SBA also has ruled alarmingly that they can slice up that $10,000 if you have fewer than 10 employees. So if you have, and they, they say 1,000 per employee, so if you have five employees, you would only get 5,000 up front. NFIB is working to fix that at the federal level. Um, more, more to follow there. Let me stop there with a reminder of some good websites, sbtfnashville.com, nfib.com backslash coronavirus. And for Tennessee-specific small business information, um, unemployment, workers' comp, state tax relief, uh, you could go to nfib.com backslash tn. My email is jim.brown at nfib.org. If any small business owners have questions, our team at NFIB, we're working for small business. We're working for you. We're watching this to ensure that businesses are taken care of. We will get back to the work, Nashville. We will. Um, thank you again, Mayor Cooper. I really appreciate your leadership. I miss seeing you at Three Brothers Coffee at, on West End, so um, uh, maybe I'll see you here in the near future. Maybe soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'd now like to introduce Lisa Quigley, 
Chief of Staff for U.S. Representative Jim Cooper. Hi, thanks so much for asking me to participate today. And I um, know we're all grateful for um, Mayor Cooper's leadership. Uh, Jim Brown is doing a terrific job for small business. We work together frequently. And I would just add before I start on unemployment insurance that um, uh, Congressman Cooper believes that uh, Congress should be returning right away or passing um, quickly, even without the members present, um, replenishment of the PBP funds that uh, ran out two nights ago. It's critical to our local businesses. Um, and he was part of assembling a group of um, 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans yesterday asking their leadership to quickly deal with PPP and leave the other priorities for um, another day. There, everything is important, but we've got to keep businesses um, getting access to these funds. I was asked to talk about unemployment insurance, um, and um, I'm happy to do that. It's a lifeline for so many um, people in our country right now, 22 million Americans have now applied for unemployment insurance, including 74,000 and counting um, Tennesseans. Um, what the federal government did is um, provided funds for the states to distribute through their unemployment insurance systems. So for example, uh, in Tennessee, um, the maximum somebody can uh, receive an, an unemployment insurance is $275 a week. Um, that's the maximum, um, and the federal government has provided another $600 on top of that. So if you receive $275 from the state of Tennessee, then um, you would also get an additional $600 um, per week from the federal government. That will be available through uh, July 31st um, of this year. And you um, have to apply at Tennessee.gov. They have um, a, a website that is um, um, easy to navigate. You don't have to do anything special to get the federal money um, as long as you are being uh, processed um, because you are eligible for unemployment insurance with the state of Tennessee, then the additional compensation from the federal government will be included in that. Um, Jim was on the, a call with the governor yesterday um, and the governor indicated that those checks with the additional funds um, should be arriving um, now, maybe as early as um, yesterday, because they were uh, uh, processed for, for distribution on Tuesday. Um, I have been also told that the state plans on retroactively providing funds uh, for people um, who apply from the date of their application. Um, if they don't get everything they expect this week, um, uh, the state is uh, uh, planning to make sure that they are retroactively paid. Um, I wanted to point out that there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of great information out there. I think that at cooper.house.gov, we have a great um, website that answers a lot of questions that people have um, about unemployment insurance. But we also are talking to people every day. If you call our office at 615-736-5295 because you prefer to talk to a real person. I certainly prefer talking to a real person. Um, please call us. We are um, answering those calls um, by close of business every day, so please feel free to reach out. Um, if you're having difficulties, we are um, happy to help. And uh, that website, again, is cooper.house.gov, and the phone number is 615-736-5295. Um, my own um, email address is lisa.quigley at mail.house.gov. Thank you, Ms. Quigley. We will now start the Q&A portion of today's briefing. I will announce your name from the podium, and you may proceed by asking your question over the air. We'll start with Julia Palazzo. Julia? Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, two questions for Mayor Cooper. The president revealing his plans to reopen the economy yesterday into three phases. Just wanted to get your reaction to that. Um, also, the future of all the businesses and employees on Broadway. Do you think they can recover from this? And since 
they attract such large crowds when we do start to reopen the economy in the city. Do you think that they should be limiting capacity, maybe taking temperatures at the door for a long period of time to come? Thank you so much. Thank you. Mayor Cooper. Um, thank you, Julia. Um, from what I gathered by the national um, comment on this is um, state and local leadership is very important in this. I know um, Governor Lee values it, and this is one of the reasons why the mayors have um, put together a task force on some of these challenging questions, which is how to do it safely. We want to do it. We need to do it. We need to do it as quickly as possible, how to do it safely. What is required? That includes Broadway and the availability of um, public health techniques to make it safer um, as we go through the phases of a phased-in reopening and to have target thresholds for when we know that we can go on to the next level and then when are we prepared with testing and equipment and capacity. Uh, and what is our general strategy to do it safely, both to keep customers safe and the staff safe. Now, I think our successful reopening on Broadway um, is hinged on doing early phases right so that we can move on. We don't want any backsliding, if at all possible, and the reintroduction of a new set of public health practices, such as taking your temperature every day, uh, such as continuing to do some level of social distancing even though while you're serving customers, these kind of specific teachable techniques, we're going to rely on our public health department in partnership with employers to provide a safe working environment for staff and a safe place for customers. And I think um, we are determined to be led by expert scientific and medical advice here. And uh, we have the same goal which is to reopen and restart safely. And, I'm, and again, I'm pleased, I think, that the national direction is to accede to states. Every region has been affected a little bit differently by this. Um, you know, mortality rates, hospitalization rates end up being very different. Some states obviously have had a horrific experience in Tennessee. We've been spared a lot of that horror, but we have plenty of sadness here, too. So it's important to get this right. Thank you, Julia. Stephen Elliott. Stephen. Hey, thank you. Um, with, with some businesses, um, additional businesses starting to open up in the next few weeks, apparently, uh, but schools remaining closed, have you considered any sorts of um, child care options or, or anything to, to deal with parents who might be having to go back to work? question is about child care for uh, the workers who are going back to work over the next few weeks. Very good question. Um, obviously a huge priority. You have to have that happen. At this time, there's not a plan, but there's going to be a plan. Um, exactly when schools are able to reopen, obviously, will change the, the child care needs. And also the phased opening will change the child care needs. This is the kind of tough, practical problem that we're going to have to solve to get us all back to work sooner. Harriet Wallace, you're in the air. Hi there. Good morning. Um, Mayor Cooper, I know you, you've kind of touched on this a little, just a little bit today, and you've addressed it before, but now that we have heard from the president, now that you all have formed the mayor's uh, regional coalition, can you speak to now, especially with those guidelines being laid out in the reopening phases from the president, how close could we be now to reopening on May 1st? Are we any closer to that or, or it's still still under advisement? Thank you. Mayor Cooper. Well, Harriet, I don't know that the report card is in yet. The, the student's doing well, but the report card is not in. It's going to be heavily determined by the 14-day number. What is the trend on the 14 days? We're still, what is that at the end of the month? What is that in the beginning of May? That needs to be a very strong trend. 
We are excited. I worry that we're sometimes too excited about the progress that we've made, but that needs to continue before you can go to the next phase. Um, this is the time to double down on our social distancing practicing. We, we can, we, we've got a goal that's in sight. Let's make sure that we get there and complete the mission. Also, for your viewers, it cannot be said too often. COVID, as Dr. Hildreth was pointing out, COVID is with us. This is a long-term strategy that's going to be required before we can fully reopen. 100% reopen is a long time, and that's going to require a change in probably a lot of our habits. Um, the disease is not going away. It is going to continue to be in our community. We're going to have to monitor outbreaks on it constantly. This is not over on some date that we move into phase one of the restart protocols. Thank you. Nayeli with 96.7. Hi, um, good morning. And I have a couple of questions. Um, I think they would probably be for Dr. Jahanger. Would you like me to ask one by one or just all of them? Just, just all of them, please. Okay. My first question is, um, Governor Billy said, and I quote, I encourage every Tennessean to remember uh, when in doubt, get a test as we work to identify COVID-19 cases and keep our neighbors safe, in a quote. With that being said, will there be a way to test healthcare workers that work directly with patients who have COVID-19? From my understanding from healthcare workers, they're not being tested unless they have a lot of bad symptoms. That's one question. Another question is, you have given us some information about racial demographics, Caucasians being nearly 50% of the cases of COVID-19, African-Americans being at higher risk of having severe problems. Could you give us those numbers of Caucasians, African Americans, and Latinos that have been in the hospitals, been tested, and fatality. My last question is, during this entire pandemic of COVID-19, we have been told to first uh, call our primary doctor um, if we're having any symptoms. However, uh, when they do call their primary doctors, they're being told to call the COVID-19 hotline um, because they do not have the testing and they do not want to expose their employees. So what exactly is the purpose behind calling their primary doctor first? Thank you. Dr. Jungier. All right, thank you. Um, first regarding healthcare workers, listen, um, I, I think healthcare workers is like all frontline um, workers, and I'm, I'm a healthcare worker who's still actively practicing, so this issue is very close to my heart. Um, every health system and every place and every fire department and police force has a plan of how, how health line, frontline health healthcare workers and first responders are assessed and tested, and, and this is critical. So I know what my plan is is my place, and I, I would recommend everyone to, to know what the plan is of your place of employment. Furthermore, our community assessment centers will test anyone that has any of the symptoms that, that you mentioned in that article you described where you quote um, Governor Lee, Commissioner Piercy also said if, if you feel ill or you feel like you need a test, go get a test. I echo that. I echo that those remarks. I, I agree with the commissioner and with Governor Governor Lee. If you're if you feel ill, and you're worried about it, get a test. And whether that's at at our community assessment centers on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which we will we will test you irrespective of your ability to pay or anything else, or whether it is at your healthcare place. You know, I, the reason um, we instruct you to call your health care um, provider is some people have a really good relationship with their health care provider. It's not an either or. It's, it's what do you feel most comfortable about? We need you to get the, the services provided. And if, that's more, if you're more comfortable getting that at our community assessment centers and system, we welcome you. If you're more comfortable with your um, nurse practitioner or physician assistant or um, primary care physician, by all means, use that source. So I, I want to be very clear. I'm encouraging you to access your healthcare system, and in places where it's harder to access the healthcare system, we're providing you an option. Regarding um, the information around um, race and ethnicity, um, as I mentioned, we will update this weekly, but to remind you of our numbers, 49% um, of our cases thus far are um, white, 13% are, are black, 12% are 
Um, other are multiracial, 3% are Asian, and 15% are pending. And, and uh, we will, as I've mentioned, weekly I will commit to giving you an update as to that number. And then there was, was there a third thing I hit all three? I think I hit all three. So thank you so much. Chair Hartnett. Kara, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Kara? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead with your question. Perfect. Um, I just wanted to follow up with what Dr. Jahangir was just saying. Um, are you still going to not deny people testing after screening? Um, because I realize you guys have been screening for those symptoms but you're saying if anyone who seeks a test gets a test, will you still be, I guess, filtering people out through the screening process, or will you be now testing everybody who's seeking a test? And the question that I actually wanted to ask, um, would you be willing to move back your reopening initiatives if we see evidence of a spike in cases from other states or metro areas that begin opening before us? And if so, what kind of spike would you have to see to make that decision? Dr. Jungier. Thank, thank you, Kara. Um, regarding tests, listen, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, 90% of patients who have COVID will have fever, shortness of breath, or, um, or um, cough, excuse me. 10% um, have other symptoms. Those, majority, those other symptoms are nuance loss of smell or diarrhea. Another part of our assessment at our assessment centers is if, if the um, person who's assessing you um, feels that you should get a test, and, and typically that's if a person feels, feels ill, we're going to test you. So I want to be very clear. If, if the reason we have assessment is, is that people, you know, we want to make sure that pe maybe somebody is having a heart attack or maybe somebody is having some symptom that needs another medical care. So I, I, I want to be very clear. Health care issues besides COVID still happen, and we need, to, we need to be very careful of that. So that's why we have people who are medically trained who are, provide assessments. So number one, um, but, but for the most part, to answer your question, if, if, if you're concerned about being ill from COVID, then you will get a test, whether it's at our system or in the state system or your medical provider, but your responsibility as a resident of this community is then you need to self-isolate. You need to not go to work. You need to stay in your house. You need to make sure you do your part. Now, regarding um, your questions of, of what, what, when we would reopen, close, et cetera, I want to highlight um, we're part of a larger task force. I'll tell you what the science has shown you, has shown, and what I suspect will drive our decisions, is typically if you start seeing an increase in cases after a downward trend of 14 days, as the mayor mentioned, if you start seeing an upward trend of about five days, that's a lagging indicator of, of what um, is really happening. So I suspect that there are a lot of very smart people on, on the group that the mayor has is, um, appointed myself and Dr. Hildreth on. Uh, I suspect some, some spectrum of that will be um, implemented. I don't know the exact number, but I'll tell you the science typically shows four to five days. Um, it may be a little more tight than that, maybe a little loose. I, I don't know. I can't speak on behalf of the whole group yet. So thank you. Our final question is from Nancy Amons. Nancy? Hi, thank you. Um, after reading the president's guidelines and hearing you today, do you ever see a point when we're going to have these massive Nashville events again, like New Year's Eve and CMA and Fourth of July? Are we forever changed? Is that even in any kind of future that we're looking at now? Do you think that'll ever happen again in Nashville? Dr. John Gear. I tell you what, I can't wait for that day. And I, I really can't. I've, I've grew up in this city, and I love all the traditions we, we have in this city. Um, and the short answer is yes, one day we hope to do that, and that day is when there's a vaccine. And um, when that vaccine will develop, gosh, I know there are a lot of really smart people working on, on that right now, and hopefully it'll be within a year. Hopefully, um, I've heard some for healthcare workers, maybe as early as, as the fall. I think that's, that's optimistic, but there's some really smart people I've heard that from. But I, I think a year to 18 months is probably more realistic for, for globally. But um, so, yeah, I think when we have a vaccine, then we can address this, this problem that we have now. And, and I hope we can join each other at, at one of these great New Year's Eve parties or, or CMA Fest or something great that we do in our city. So, yes, don't lose faith in this. 
There are no more media questions in the WebEx queue at this time. Broadcast COVID-19 press briefings will resume at 9.30 a.m. on Monday, April 20th. Daily press updates will be emailed to all local media on Saturday and Sunday morning, and residents can visit covid19.nashville.gov to read about any new developments over the weekend. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's Metro COVID-19 press briefing. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.